So, the, so Patrick just talked about how some of us are raised in a negative environment, some perhaps in a positive environment. So here's my response to that. And, it, and history will show whether or not it is perceived that even the environment that Ronnie and I are giving our kids is either positive or negative, okay? However, let's, say, let's take a look at a, at a positive, what we would classify as a positive environment. Here's what I'm learning about the sin nature also, kind of like what we just talked about with the personalities. My kids have a perception that is tainted by the fallen DNA. So even if I believe, e even if somebody can look at me, which is, even if somebody can look at me and say, hey, you know what, Don Brewer is a gentle, kind man when he deals, which is not true, when he deals in discipline with his kids. Let's say I could do that. They still look at that through a fallen lens. And they can either have a positive or negative view of that that they're going to react to. Does that, do you understand what I'm saying? So even, even if you could look at a family, which I, I would argue that no, no family is, every family is dysfunctional to a certain extent. However, even if somebody can deal in a positive or gentle uh, you know, way with their children that is instructive, and I could look at that and say, gosh, that looks like it'd be helpful. And I, I would think that kids would respond in a positive way to that. I've seen, you know, later on, or I've seen that same kid, perhaps they look at that through a lens and they're seeing it from a completely skewed view. And they see dad as too passive or too, not strong enough, or, you know what I mean? So the, the sinful DNA is, this is where it gets just crazy. It is so embedded into the, the DNA of us. That that's, this, is where, this is why I'm saying I truly believe that we have raised the bar on what, at least what I understand is, is sin. Whereas before I used to see sin as these actions, sure we would say it's in the heart, sure we would say that we're born with it, all that good biblical, you know, good Christian-y stuff or churchy stuff. But now I'm seeing sin in a completely different way that realizes that, yeah, God should extinguish us as a result of the way that we are. Because all of it, you know, so we talk about these things. Again, look at, look at the kid who, let's say mom and dad are dealing with, with him or her in a, in a seemingly kind and gentle manner, regardless of what's going on in the heart of, of the parent, but they're, they're dealing with patience and kindness and gentleness. I'm laughing because I don't know a parent that's able to do that, but there's a parent out there that can do that. The kid that looks at that with a skewed view and sees their parent in a negative light in some way because of their skewed view has everything to do with what we've talked about before regarding king. That child is the king and queen of their kingdom, and they are believing that mom and dad should either are seeing it wrong or should handle it in a different way. They are taking the seat of that parent to say, I'm in judgment over you, mom and dad, and I think you're handling this wrong. You don't see it clearly. I, it's Job. It's, it's Job again. It's the same, and, and again, what the child does in that instance is the same thing that we do with God. We, we sit in authority over God and say, God, I believe you, you are not seeing this clearly. And if I were you, and then fill in the blank. Exactly what Job does. See, so when, you, when I see sin like that, because before I used to say, well, no, I'm not really a rebel. I don't see myself as rebellious, even though I could look at certain actions that I would do and say, well, yeah, God could perceive that as rebellious, but I'm not doing it out of an angry, rebellious heart. Now I look at it differently and say, oh, yeah. No, I, that's totally rebellious because I'm the king of my domain. And I see things clearer than God does. That's the heart of Job. That's the heart of kids. That's the heart of us. And now, now we see grace. I see grace totally different. And I need help seeing that more and more. Okay, where were we going with that? We talked about change in last week. What's that, Greg? Relationships. Tying, the, connecting this dot with relationship that we, I think, 
Christians somewhat understand the vertical, but this whole horizontal thing is a mystery. And part of it is a mystery because we can begin to move out in relationship, like you were saying with the, hey, I've got a different personality, it's, it's, it's hard for me. That's where you start using words like, it's scary. Guess what? As soon as we use words like that, it's an immediate indicator that, hey, I, I'm, I'm still functioning in fear, which is kingdom protecting. I, I am afraid of other people. Well, why am I afraid of other people? Why would any of us be, what would be, we be afraid of? Rejection, embarrassment, judgment, not accepted, being seen as less than. See, all of that is the fallen mindset. That's what we're in bondage to with the fallen mindset. I think the big reason why God says, you know what I want you to do now? I want you to, to I'm giving you the freedom to now move into relationship with other people, knowing that you're still going to experience some of that stuff. But now I've freed you from that. You don't have to protect yourself anymore because it's a slam dunk. I'm, I'm protecting you. you your, your protection is secure for eternity. I, we just don't believe that. So how does he help us to believe that more and more? He says, now, as long as you're on this earth, I want you to continue. I want you to begin by walking and moving in towards in relationship with other people. Does that trigger any of the stuff that you brought up this morning? So I wrote some things down. Anybody, anybody else have any thoughts? That's everything that we talked about in Job. You name it. Pick, pick a character. Job, Joseph, David. Those are the big main people that we've talked about a lot here over the last cor the, the course of, of two years. Is that the biggest thing that I believe is going on in the change process is the exposure, the exposure piece. I need help being exposed. I see my, just like I talked about with the kids, I see myself through a deceived lens and I need, I need others to help me see it. Sometimes God imposes that without us being willing participants. Job. And what I'm saying about being proactive and our part in this change process is we can enter into relationships knowing that that's, going to take place, and knowing that I'm going to have bad, it, it's still, I just had an epiphany in the bathroom. Doesn't that happen with you guys too? When I was thinking about this, and we've talked about, this is just another way of saying, uh, of saying it, and I don't know how to really draw. This is, that's a lens, okay? Um, so, again, uh, I don't know about lens. We'll just do this. It's, it's a portal. Where's my, where's Caleb when I need him? A portal. It's a portal that I'm going to call conflict. What is a guarantee to happen in relationships? All different forms of it, right? Maybe it's not blatant, outright conflict between two people, but what is eventually going to happen as, as far as that striving piece or the anxiety, you know, the, the opposite of resting, like we've talked about the last two weeks, the opposite of resting, you, you fill in the blank. Stress, anger, anxiety, worry, you name it. When you are in relationship with other people, what happens? I mean, do you guys believe that or are you just nodding your head? Or I, maybe I should say, does anybody struggle with that or not, not believe that? Oh, I thought you had, I was saying from a, from a philosophical standpoint, who struggles with the fact that if when I say that Whenever you're in relationship with somebody, eventually you're going to bump into some kind of conflict. Oh, okay, so now think about this in kind of the theological, in, in God's realm. Look at what he does in conflict, especially if we know that this is the process. We don't run out to be in conflict with people. Hey, let's fight. That's not, that's not what we do, just like I won't run out and jump in front of a truck, even though God may use that as I'm sitting in the hospital room. We don't do that on purpose, but knowing what the fallen nature is, knowing what our DNA is, knowing that in relationships this happens, I, I think this is the part where God says, I've, and, and we'll, we'll tackle that, uh, that identity piece that we talked about last, uh, last week. As a matter of fact, I, I might tackle some of it here in just a minute. Like Paul, the Apostle Paul keeps saying, this is what we once were, we might look at uh, Ephesians here in just a minute. 
We, you were dead in your trespasses and, si- and sins. You were spiritually dead. God made you alive. And in, in that spiritual deadness, you then functioned in a particular manner, that, like we just talked about. Yeah, I'm in self-defense. I'm in defense mode. I'm in attack mode. I, I'm in it for me, not for other people. Okay, that's how we function in that realm. And now God, when he infuses spiritual life, he's, and that's, he says, now I've freed, I've given you spiritual life. I've given you life. You are now freed. I have loosened the bonds of that slavery and those shackles that you were under, which, which was, hey, I, I had the responsibility of being the king of my world. That, that was my perception. If you think about it that way. I had all the responsibilities of a king in the former way of living. And now when God frees me from that, guess what I'm released from? Self. I'm released from the responsibilities of being a king. Even though that's a completely fallen mindset that is my bad perception, my fallen sinful perception of the world, God frees me from that. And now that responsibility is gone. I don't have to walk around like a scared animal looking at looking that way to make sure nothing's going to hit me from that out of the sky. Looking that way. Like I I've, I've gave that example a few weeks ago regarding the deer in the woods. You can look at every animal that walks in your yard. is petrified by fear. Every human that walks on the face of this earth is petrified by fear. Now that, that might be distracting to you because you might not think that you're walking around petrified by fear. But in some way, shape, or form, you are. So guess what God has freed us from? The responsibilities of being the authority of myself and me thinking I'm the authority of everybody around me. And now I'm set free. Now the whole freedom thing now makes sense to me. Because I had this weight, this burden of responsibility on my shoulders that believed that self had to do everything. If if anything good was going to happen to me, self had to do it. Now God has released me from that. I am free from that, and now what can I do? I can live, and I can walk in relationship with other people without having this mindset anymore. The problem is, it's, I still have that mindset to a certain extent. You guys see that? That's the problem. I'm, I'm so used to functioning in this way, that's why I think God says, hey, you know what I want you to do in relationships, you guys? You're free from that. Now I want you to exercise that. That's the freedom exercise that I think God is talking about. That's why in Galatians, he says in in chapter 5, it was for freedom that God has set you free. It's the same thing that Paul says over and over again. He says, you know what? You're set free. Now go move in love towards other people. It's not a law. It's I mean, in one sense, you could say it's a mandate, but it's not a mandate in the sense of a law. Like, okay, now I need to grit my teeth and go love people I can't stand. You you could take it that way, but now you're just putting on another burden on your shoulders. If we can actually see this in terms of what of what Greg just said and how we've looked at this in Job, in Joseph, and every other Bible story in the Bible, because that's where they are, that's what God is doing in the change process. He is, he is taking a redeemed person like Abraham and Sarah, people, and even though they already have all the righteousness that they're going to get because it's imputed righteousness, and God gives a promise to them as to what he's going to do, what are they still used to, how, how are they still used to functioning in the old way? And again, the DNA kicks in, They think God isn't functioning in the appropriate timeline, the appropriate manner, and it just isn't making sense. And instead of being able, again, to tie the sermons together that we've been hearing the last couple of weeks, instead of being able to rest and say, you know what, I'm going to wait on on the Lord because I can believe that what he says is true, what do they do? They function in the in in the same way that they're used to functioning in. And again, God doesn't then just shame them because of it. God still works despite of it. But what does he do in the process? He exposes them for who they are. He exposes them and lets them, again, in an act of mercy, instead of striking them down, even though there's consequences that are involved in the decisions that they make, he miraculously and mercifully 
still works a miracle in their life and accomplishes the transformation and the change that, that God intended from the very beginning. So the relationship piece, God says, now you're free from this way of thinking. Now I want you to go practice it. I want you to move forward in that. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be ugly. You're still going to, I think, Linda, you said, you're, you're still going to experience disloyalty at times. But guess what you can always be encouraged by? Jesus, your king, did the same thing. And guess what he did? I mean, that's the gospel. That's the fundamental aspect of the gospel is that we can keep encouraging each other that even when it hurts, even when we don't want to do it at some point, even when we say, this just doesn't even make any sense, together we can keep saying, hey, you know what? Hey, you're right, but neither did what Jesus did. That didn't make any sense at all. The creator of the world comes and, and bears the betrayal, the disloyalty, and the despisement. Is that a word? The despising. It is now. Thank you, Patrick. That's affirming. The despisement of his creatures. Well, first of all, I would say one of the reasons why this relationship thing doesn't work, hasn't worked in the church, or that, that dot hasn't been connected, is because I think... Typically, the view of Christians in the church is if there's conflict, something's wrong and it's bad. So instead of saying, hey, you know what? I want to walk into that conflict. I want to look at conflict like Paul looks at, like he said in this is where I would tie that Galatians 6 passage that he says, bear one another's burdens. And in so doing, you fulfill the law of Christ. I think the bearing is part of walking into conflict. I know you and I have talked about it before. I think I've said it from the pulpit. But I remember, if, if I can remember the, the way that my supervisor had said it in, during a course that I took, uh, clinical pastoral education. My supervisor had talked about conflict in the sense that um, conflict is the means in which intimacy, real intimacy can be acquired or, or experienced or gotten between two people. That's right, because there's two ways that you can, you can deal with conflict, right? So here's one, here's two. So what happens if you deal with, what, what's the normal way of dealing with conflict? Or what are some of the ways? Run, avoid. Anger, fight, prove, so defend. No, I'm right, and you're wrong. Yeah, did we, did we hear that? How long this, did we hear that this morning between two little children? Two literal children, that wasn't Ronnie and I. Run, avoid, anger, fight, defend. I mean, with conflict, yeah, it's as soon as we, I mean, that's what happens with most, with many relationships. As soon as I begin to feel that yucky stress stuff, it's, uh, I, 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 you know, we, we'll go all the way around this thing to, uh, other than deal with it, because it's, it just seems too hard. Of course, the reality is, then we make a situation that's even harder than what can happen before, but it doesn't matter. So one, you, he, here's, here's conflict. We bump into it and we just go the other way, right? Is there intimacy there? I mean, what happens in the relationship when this, hap when, when this takes place? There's no relationship. It's destroyed. It's damaged. What's the other way? I mean, it's, and this is this way that I'm talking about, that if we actually see, it's why I've said to Jeff, we need to, I need to write a theology of conflict because I think the biblical view of conflict is the idea that I'm free, I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to defend myself. I don't, it, w when I feel those pangs of wanting to defend myself, that is exposure that says, hey, Don, you're acting like a king again. That, that doesn't, again, in the, in the practical piece of it, that doesn't mean that it's wrong to talk about some of that stuff. That's how, you, that's how you actually deal with conflict or work through it. But now, I think what a biblical view of con conflict is, is that, oh, my, you know, my goodness, this feels gross. I don't like this stress and anxiety. But I know that if I ignore it or I run from it, it's, it that, that relationship is just going to be demolished. So therefore, what do I believe God is going to do in the midst of conflict? 
What, about, what do I believe that God does with conflict? Look at David. What, what did God do in the midst of that crazy conflict? And it was lots of lives ruined with, with that big incident. We're not just talking about an argument. We're talking about what David did with Bathsheba and the, and, and the whole family there and, and all kinds of other people. God exposed David for who he was. He worked a miracle in David's heart so that David actually said, yes, that's me. And he got down on his knees and said, I need help. Please forgive me. I mean, that's, that's just kind of a, trying to use an, a, an example of a story that you guys know. But what does God do in conflict? There's a big R word I'm thinking of. Redeems. He redeems. He is the redeemer. In this way of functioning as the king, I break relationships. I, I, I demolish relationships when they're no longer good for me. I avoid the discomfort and the pain and all of that stuff. But now that he has released me from that burden to where I'm no longer an authority trying to determine if I'm right or if Linda's right. And if Linda's wrong, guess what? She needs to pay the consequences of that wrongness. No, I believe that, you know what God is doing whenever I experience conflict? For me or to me? Is what? He's exposing me for who I am. He's exposing the old DNA. And he's giving me the opportunity to say, God, I need help. Because I'm trying to function as the king again, and you're the real king. Help me to rest in trusting that you're the real king that's in, that, that knows what you're doing with this. And now help me to move towards this other person and, and give me the ability to be honest and to be patient. And even if I'm not, to, that, that, we can, that we can strive in the midst of this relationship so that we can come out now on the back end of this and guess what can be established as a result of moving through conflict. It's some of those things that we talked about last week that we're so afraid of, or that we want so desperately that we don't think that we can get. Trust. What are some of the other ones? Just list them. Intimacy. What's involved in intimacy? I mean, it's, yeah, we so often think of that in the physical sense, but what is, what is relational intimacy? Well, there you go. Vulner, uh, vulnerability has to do with I, I, want, I want to trust people. I want to trust people with, my, with the things that I'm struggling with. Would you say safety? Safety. How about the things that we know that Christ gives us? Forgiveness? How about that? I just heard it. Peace. A safe place. You know, how often do we hear about that kind of a safe place? That a relationship is a safe place. That there's, again, that, that word, there's, there's no more condemnation. I can go be real with somebody and say that I'm struggling. Could I do that over here when I was the authority of my world? Well, maybe I could, but what was I afraid of? Rejection. I was afraid of the rejection of my subjects. If you, that's the way I look at it. Now, now there's safety. There's no condemnation. I have, there's forgiveness. There's peace. There's comfort. There's hope. Did I hear a but? Oh, oh okay. Got it. See, we're related. <laughs> See, that's how we get to these. It's still a miracle that's done by the real king, but that's where I'm convinced he's saying, you know what I want you guys to do as long as I have you on this earth? All that stuff that you hated doing before because you were shackled by your own sin, fallen nature, you are free to now experience this with other people. Because I'm telling you, you're already experiencing this with me, and all of that is secure in me. Now it's almost like this is, this is the real walk, walk in the light like we talked about last week. But this is like the real walk of faith. How do you really rest? 
It's being able to, one, rest that God knows what he's doing in the midst of this conflict. God knows what he's doing even if I experience the rejection of somebody else. All of this isn't guaranteed, is it? It's not guaranteed with another person. That's what's still so scary about it. But even if I don't, or especially if I don't get here with a person, what is God still doing in your heart? He's still doing this. He's still working an, a, a miraculous act in your heart, even if intimacy isn't experienced. And, and what I, too often I think people look at this in a short-term time frame, whereas I'm looking at this from a lifetime perspective. That even if temporarily we don't experience these things with, the pe with people, relationship, I think one of you guys talked about whether it be the um, introvert thing to where, hey, it's, it, it's scary to um, maybe me even meet other people. Well, again, I'm not turning this into a formula that says, okay, all you guys, let's take a number in church here and let, let's start moving towards relationships with, with each other. No, it's not a formula. It is a, a way of walking in the light in which we are moving forward in relationship with people, but those relationships take how long to develop? It means there's a commitment of, of sorts. That's why even moving around from church to church and all over the place it actually does the opposite, even though there can be valid reasons to move from a church. But again, the way our um, practice of church so often sometimes can not be facilitating of relationships. So it's a, it's a lifetime thing. It's... It's a long-term thing, and it's a purposeful thing. Sometimes relationships can, can just happen, but oftentimes, especially with what we're talking about, how, and just to remind you of what we were talking about, what is my involvement in the change process of God in my life? What, because what I am always asked over and over again is, okay, but what can I do? What is my role? Because I, you know, that I, it is, um, it is basically said, no, who, who, who does the change in your life? God does. C can you do anything with, with or towards that? I'm not, I'm not being clear. It's God's job to change your heart and your life. And I promise you, he's going to do it. The question keeps on being, yeah, but what can I do? So what, what I'm saying is, what, what can we do? One, realize what God is doing in relationship. This is what, you're, you're always in a change process. You're always in this, this situation, somehow, some way. And he is always doing this to you. And that is merciful. And he's saying, I want you to do that with other people. So be purposeful about doing that with other people. Move in relationship to other people. You know, what's interesting about that uh, agreement piece or, or how typically we've seen relationships is that relationships in the old way of thinking are conditional. If then, if I experience loyalty, then you're, you're going, I'm going to give you loyalty back. Again, think of it in terms of kings and queens. Loyalty is a, is a conditional thing. And as soon as loyalty is withdrawn or a, a perception of loyalty is withdrawn and now I see you as an enemy, our relationship is ruined. So there's an interesting thing that happens with Christ. What does he say about our relationship? I, I didn't even hear a cricket there. With him and our relationship with us. Our relationship and what he does in his act of grace is, is, is unbreakable. It's secure. And I would even say, regardless of what you believe regarding um, election or not, I believe that what we can say regarding God's children is, it's secure. That's what Paul says in the beginning of Ephesians. I mean, let's just to end this, let's read the beginning of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is, blessed, 
is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight, in love. He did this by predestining us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved Son." In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Uh, look at this. Uh, we're, verse 11, in Christ we too have been claimed as God's own possession since we are predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Uh, where does it say... Well, he goes on, and we don't have time to continue. Well, maybe I'll tackle that in the weeks to come. The point is, Christ says that this relationship is not conditional. His love is unconditional. He, he first loved us, right? Over and over again in Scripture. He's the one that moved towards us. He's the one that forgives us. He's the one that gives us every spiritual blessing. And he says, you know what? That relationship is secure. So now you can... You can be free to love me too because you're no longer in the, in the kingdom mentality again. It's the same way with relationships with people, but I don't think we see it like that. Over and over again, I've had uh, recent conversations with people in which I've had a conflict of some sort with them. And what was, guess what their greatest fear was in that conflict when we were actually starting to talk about it? Or do you know what it is? Can you guess? That it was going to be conditional. That their fear was our relationship was going to be damaged because of the conflict. And one of the first things I said to them is, hey, you know what? Yeah, I may be angry at you. I may be disappointed. I may even be condemning towards you. I, I may have all kinds of ugly stuff, but, but I, want you to, to, I want to make one thing clear. Our relationship is secure. Even if I'm the one treating you badly, I'm telling you, we can work through this thing and experience intimacy on the back end, even if I don't want to at some times. But I'm telling you that our relationship is secure. You don't have to worry about the fact that I'm going to say, to heck with you, I'm done. I'm never talking with you again. I think it is a huge basis for us understanding conflict and working through it especially as a church here, as we try to practice that in the relationships that are established and are being established, is that you can say, that you, we can say this with people that, that you might not even be able to, you can't stand. Recognizing that God is revealing that, hey, look, you can't stand somebody. That's, that's acting according to your king or queen self. God is exposing that to you. He's giving you the opportunity to see what God is changing in your life. And now I can sit with that person and working towards this, even though I don't feel like I'm even close to any of those things, say our relationship is secure because of what he's done and what he's established. And guess what he's telling me that I can do? I can walk in freedom. And that's the crazy thing. As we talk about conflict here in this way, there's a lot of this that sure doesn't feel like freedom, does it? I think part of it is because we're so used to acting in this way. Guess what? Guess what is... It is much easier to act in what way? What? Which is what? I'm going to pull out my sword and hack heads off. Figuratively. That's easy. I'm striving. See, that's the striving piece that, we keep, that we're talking about and making the connection with the sermons as far as resting. I can now rest. I don't have to strive. I don't have to hack somebody's head off because I see them as an enemy. I know Christ knows exactly what he's doing with that relationship. I know that Christ is working in that person's heart even if I can't stand him right now. And I know that by being honest with this relationship here and being able to try to communicate, move in communication, that you know what? God may miraculously create this stuff right here. Yeah, and this would be a great thing. I just write that down because I'll take a picture of this and we can, we can talk more about this. Um, it's great because I've had this talk with many, many, many people. 
I. Well, it isn't a departure in the sense of how how are we being honest in the midst of the conflict and what are we communicating about? And is it appropriate to talk about setting boundaries or what, what, however you want to describe that? I think that's part of the honesty piece within the conflict. It's, it's okay to be honest and say, I don't feel safe in a relationship. That's part, of, that's part of moving into the relationship. Instead of ignoring it and just hoping it goes away, or totally dis, you know, um, throwing it, uh, that relationship away. Part of the honesty piece and, re and recognizing conflict in this way and how God is using it is I can move into that conflict and be honest about how I feel and what I am still scared of. And you know, though, that's all legitimate. And, and yeah, we, I can't talk about it right now, but that's, to me, that's part of striving in the conflict. And, and all of it is appropriate. And, I hope this doesn't bother anybody, I mean, I do, I will talk about, what, 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 so what does it mean to be a doormat? Does that mean I just, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the, the subject of, you know, physical, I mean, we can talk, we'll talk about that when we talk about this in a whole uh, Sunday school, but, yeah, I won't even go there yet, so we'll, we'll tackle that at a different time. That's a good, that's a really good one, in talking about the, the honesty piece in striving in the, in the conflict.